Okay, I think all participants have joined. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. We actually have participants joining from many regions of the world, which uh, I think is fantastic. I would like to welcome you all to our webinar, Carbon Pricing and Net Zero. Today, we would like to take stock of recent carbon pricing developments around the globe and discuss the challenges and also hopefully future projections and plans. But most of all, we would like to address the question of whether a price on carbon can drive climate action towards net zero by 2050, the big challenge and uh, question that we face today. So this webinar is uh, organized by the Polycarbon team. Polycarbon is a research project that is financed by the European Research Council, and it analyzes the global expansion, but also contraction of carbon pricing policies, uh, perceiving them as a system. We're honored that the Italian government has included our webinar in the All for Climate Initiative, which precedes the uh, long-awaited conference of the parties in Glasgow, which will take place in November um, this year. The focus of this All for Climate Initiative is actually on youth. And for this re reason, a number of our students from KU Leuven, and in particular of the course Global Environmental Politics, but also students from many other universities have joined us today. But of course, many other participants um, are there um, as well. And I see there are more coming in actually. Um, the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies hosts this event and has provided fantastic logistical and technical support. Thank you very much for doing that. Um, we are pleased that so many experts from various regions of the world have agreed to join our panel today. My colleague Valeria Samyanki will introduce them later. Now, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, uh, Professor Dr. Jos Galbeke, who teaches at KU Leuven and at the European University Institute in Florence. But maybe more importantly, he was one of the architects of the European Union's emissions trading system when he still worked for the European Commission. And there, he also was Director General of the Directorate of Climate Action and actually shaped many of the European Union's internal and international climate policies. Joss, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much and uh, good morning, good afternoon to many of the colleagues I had the pleasure to work with uh, over the last uh, years. Um, uh, I would like to congratulate you with this initiative. I think it's very timely uh, because um, we know since uh, Bill Nordhaus got the Nobel Prize in 2018 that putting a price on carbon is so essential. And uh, we know you can do it through taxes, through markets, um, and uh, discussing this is a big topic amongst economists. Now, let me make for the introduction three points, and it will be very brief. Uh, the first is that it is a very, very good sign that the EU uh, strongly uh, keeps believing in carbon pricing and carbon markets in the EU ETS as a pillar of its range of policy instruments. It's one of the instruments, it's being complemented by many other instruments, but it is being built on, it's being extended, it's being deepened, it's being made more ambitious. And we see the impact of that. The emissions go down. You know, we are today at uh, minus 43% in not more than 15 years. Uh, of existence of the EU ETS. Um, we have done this emission reduction cost effectively, which I think is very important because you cut down emissions where they are the cheapest. And we observe today that the market is believing that this is going to continue. Prices are at record highs and they are beyond 60 euros per ton of carbon dioxide. They are on the rise throughout the globe but uh, in Europe, I think we are breaking records. Now, that brings me to the second point. This high price, of course, creates debate. And uh, there are two elements in that debate. There is the social impact and there is the carbon leakage impact. The social impact, you know, energy prices today are at record levels. And part of that debate is to what extent the ETS the EU ETS is a factor in, this, in those high um, energy prices. Uh, we talk about gas prices, we, don't, we talk about electricity prices, 
Um, now we can debate for uh, a long time to what extent the EU ETS is a factor in that, but it is, it's not the predominant factor, but it is a factor. And brings to the question, uh, brings the question forward, how are we going to make a social correction to those who risk falling into the trap of energy poverty? And uh, I think that's a debate that's going to start. The European Commission proposed a social climate fund, um, but we cannot wait for the social climate fund. It will take us a couple of years before it is operational. We have to and must find a solution to the high energy prices, you know, almost today, if not tomorrow, and at the latest the day after tomorrow. Otherwise, the Fit for 55 policy range of proposals that is on the table is going to be hurt. It's going to be hit by the high uh, electricity and gas prices. The other correction that is necessary is for carbon leakage. Uh, we have not seen much of carbon leakage in the past, but with the prices that we are currently experiencing, more than 60 euros per ton, we can expect carbon leakage to intensify. And so that's why the Commission proposed a carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, that is not particularly well received in many other places in the world. Um, but I would like to underline that the Commission was wise to start this CBAM, uh, this CBAM operating not earlier than 2026. That means there is a great opportunity to talk with the rest of the world about how to elaborate a good system that is preventing carbon leakage. And that is continuing to reduce the carbon emissions that we need, because that is the ultimate um, uh, the ultimate goal of anything we are doing. And we see the impact already. Uh, people, uh, countries are speaking out, not particularly falling in love with it, but if countries, even as Russia or Saudi Arabia, you know, are looking into how to start carbon pricing, that's a sign that it is important and that the message has been received. So much more debate on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, and that's going to be a, a, a very interesting um, journey for all of us. Brings me to the last question, the international developments. Um, the EU ETS is a compliance market. Uh, there are several constituencies in the world also um, opting for a compliance market. That means a market that is created by governments. We have seen that in China, we see that in California, we see that in Canada, in New Zealand. Uh, in Korea. Uh, many others are discussing that, like Mexico, Chile, and others. We will hear more of that in the debate I hear. And it is good to have strength in cooperation between those compliance markets. But the new kit on the block are the so-called voluntary markets. Uh, the offsets that are being uh, created by companies or by authorities are being traded on a totally freely market uh, where there is no intervention or structuring element by authorities, by governments. So that free market, is it going to deliver real emission reductions? It's pricing, but what is it pricing entirely uh, is entirely unsure. Uh, there is a, perhaps a looming lack of trust in that market. Uh, the task force of Mark Carney on how to scale up those markets is looking into all these questions. But the point is, Europe is not going for these voluntary markets, but major parts of the world are going for the voluntary markets. So it begs me to two questions that may be taken up by one or the other in the debate is, what is the interplay between those two sorts of markets, between compliance markets and voluntary markets? I think that's at the heart of the polycentric you know, debate. Um, and also at the heart of that debate is how can we move from voluntary markets to compliance markets? China did it. They started uh, with the implementation of the CDM under the Kyoto Protocol in a very you know, um, non-structured manner, if I may say so. The only structure was the United Nations offering this CDM proposal, but the local um, or the, the governmental authorities were not very much mingling into that. We know what's happened to the CDM. Uh, it was not a successful end. Uh, the debate rages, but the more interesting debate is 
how can voluntary markets move us into compliance markets, something that China did successfully or is being you know, in the process of doing, I think, rather successfully. So I will li limit my comments to that. I think markets are in play. They are part of a wide range of instruments in climate policy. We see an uptake internationally and the carbon border adjustment mechanism may encourage that and I think is likely to encourage that. So it brings the issue of the day much closer to the reality, not only how to strengthen cooperation, but also how to make sure that net zero, uh, which is a quite uh, ambitious uh, proposal for many uh, countries, including the EU, how is net zero being helped by carbon markets? So thank you for your attention and over uh, to you, uh, Katja. Thank you, Professor Dr. Katja Biedenkov, and thank you, Professor Dr. Jos Dalbeke, for your introductions. Now we can start to dive in the topic of carbon pricing and uh, climate action even further together. The word goes to Professor Dr. Gorilde Echelunde, who will present the challenges of developing ETS uh, systems in China. Thank you very much. <laughs> Trying to figure out um, uh, I don't know what happens here. I don't know. So we we can see your screen. You can see my screen? Yes, yes we can see your screen. Okay. So sorry, it didn't look now. You can see the full screen, right? No, yes, I perfect. Uh, it disappeared somehow, but okay. So let me just dive into this. And um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak today on a very important uh, topic of um, ETS, Emissions Trading System, or the carbon market. And um, just very um, uh, quickly, an outline for my very brief uh, intervention. It's a background for the ETS in China, stages of ETS in China, governance and organizational issues, design of the system, and some challenges at um, the end. I wanted to mention that this is based, uh, my presentation is based on recent research together with um, other colleagues at FNI, Future Finance Institute of Norway, together with Stan Stahl and Metista, as well as with uh, Duan Maosheng, who is a professor at Tsinghua University. I'm very much involved in developing the um, ETS in, in China. So why ETS in China, the background? And of course, China is the largest emitter um, of all countries, uh, emitting 28 to 30% of all um, CO2 emissions in the world. And this increase has come very quickly, uh, 3.7 times um, in 2018 compared, compared with the 1990. So uh, climate change has become a topic of concern for the Chinese government. And of course, climate change is linked to energy and China's um, uh, climate mix sorry, energy mix is uh, coal fossil uh, dominated. So air pollution has actually been a big issue in China and has been the biggest driver for uh, climate change policies and energy revolution issues in, in, in China. So um, <clears throat> China decided then to establish a carbon market as part of its uh, 12th five-year plan, which was already in 2011. And they decided to depart uh, from command and control policies uh, to a certain extent because they realized that some of these uh, targets they had set, they were not uh, being reached by command and control policies. So market mechanisms uh, were to play a role in, in uh, China's um, uh, policies, uh, climate policies and energy policies. And so uh, the ETS was included in the 12 five-year plan. And actually, Xi Jinping, the, the, uh, as everybody knows, I suppose, he announced in 2015 that um, the, the climate, uh, the, the carbon market will be launched in 2017. And before that, there were seven pilots launched in 2013 and 2014, as we can see on the map here. I don't want to spend time to go into the different uh, cities but, um, and provinces. But um, they were supposed to, to work uh, and to get experiences from the, for the national ETS in that period. And as Jos also mentioned that uh, the carbon market and or the ETS is uh, one of several policies to address uh, carbon emissions in, in China. So there are uh, other policies, of course, as well, uh, renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, et cetera. And recently there were 
two very important new targets, and that is to uh, peak emissions before 2030 and also to become carbon neutral by, um, by 2060. So these are the dual uh, carbon targets for, for China. Uh, another imp very important aspect, uh, back to why China wanted to start uh, or to include ETS in its um, climate policies is, of course, international collaboration. And the EU has been very important here, working together with China for a number of years on developing EU ATS, uh, sorry, the, the ETS in China based or not based on, but with um, some, um, how should I say, uh, experiences from the EU ETS. Norway is involved, the World Bank, ADB, Asian Development Bank, in the UK, California, Australia, etc. So this is kind of a background for, for the ETS in China, which is important to keep in mind because it's, um, um, so, um, uh, so back to or to the status of uh, of the ETS, uh, the current status. So uh, carbon market was uh, officially launched or formally launched, would some people say, in in 2017, with a two-year trial period, one year to sort of set up the system construction period, as some someone calls it, and also a simulation a year for simulation, the simulating the market. And then there was a short delay. So the carbon market actually they started trading in July 2021. And from the beginning, eight sectors were identified for the carbon market in China, but um, it was decided that the power sector would be the first sector to begin with. And one some reasons for this is that uh, the statistical system in the power sector is uh, relatively uh, complete and regarded as uh, uh, better quality than in other sectors. And the ETS is quite important if it is successful in, in China and in the power sector, because um, um, it's, it's estimated to cover more than 4 billion tons of CO2, which is like 40% of China's CO2 emissions in the power generation sector. So quite important, eventually. Prices have been a bit low. Uh, they started out uh, at a high level, but now it was more only 5 euros uh, recently. The trading platform is operated by the Shanghai Environment and Energy Exchange, and the national register is uh, based in Wuhan in Hubei. And what's happening to the pilots now, it's, uh, they still operate in parallel, but uh, gradual inclusion in the national ETS will, will happen. So this is a timeline, I won't go into that very much now, but you can see that the, 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 the um, uh, ETS has been planned and uh, developed for quite some time in, in China. So with regard to the governance and organizational, um, one um, key milestone for the ETS was the finalization of the national measures uh, by the Ministry of Eco Ecology and Environment. So they were effective 1st February and they provide the regulatory or legal basis for the national ETS. And they have now moved into the first phase where 2,225 companies from the power sector is, um, is involved. And uh, the minimum 20, there's a minimum of 26,000 CO2 equivalents in annual emissions in that period of 2013 to 2013. That's the, 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 the request or requirements for the, the participation in the, in the first phase of the companies. And currently the permits are handed out for free and it's based on the benchmarking system. It's um, also a multi-level governance system as it's called in, in China, which means that uh, the central authorities set rules and the, the, the ETS um, is implemented by the provinces. What is important to note is that the CO2 is an intensity, sorry, the ETS in China is an intense CO2 intensity based trade scheme and it's not absolute cap such as in the EU ETS. So with regard to um, uh, institutional perspective, the Ministry of Ecology and um, an environment uh, was given the responsibility for a uh, for the um, ETS in, in China in 2018, following a government uh, reshuffle at that time. Before that, the National Development and Reform Commission led the efforts uh, of the carbon markets in, in China. And um, <clears throat> but then again, in 2021, there was a reversal of that policy. So now the NDRC is now leading the efforts of the dual carbon targets that I mentioned before, that is the 2030 goal and the 2060 carbon neutrality. So, um, but the, again, the MEE is still in charge of the national ETS and the National Energy Administration is responsible for the energy sector. So actually the, the very close coordination is needed among, um, among these actors. 
just very quickly about the design. It will cover only CO2 emissions, but may gradually include other greenhouse gases. Only the pilot Chongqing was the, the one to cover six the greenhouse gases. So allowances, as I mentioned, distributed for free initially, but the, the rules, they open also for auctioning. So a, a share of the permits in, in time. With regard to the regulations for monitoring, reporting, and verification, there are a number of guidelines that have been developed during this period, the, together also with the international community of the projects that I mentioned before. Uh, and of course, uh, annual uh, reporting of emissions is to be submitted and the emissions must be verified by third party verifier. So these are very uh, quick uh, on, on the design and then for the challenges. And um, like I said, the, the new mitigation targets in China, um, the ETS uh, will be important in reaching these targets to peak before 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060. Another point to note is that it, the ETS regulation must be adopted by the State Council. I mean, currently it's the department regu regulations and there's um, authority is less, um, I mean, the State Council is on a higher level than the, the ME, for instance, the, the ministry. Also, the high and stable price levels would be necessary you know, to incentivize the, 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 the enterprises. Uh, also, the you know to include more sectors uh, will be necessary, uh, and um, cement and uh, electrolytic aluminium producers will likely be included in 2022. And as I mentioned, coordination is very important between the ME and the NDRC and EA. And of course, the data quality in all sectors must be ensured. And uh, fines, now the fines are quite low for non-compliance. And originally in the draft uh, regulations, the fines were much higher. But in the final, they decided to go lower, maybe also to make sure that the companies want to participate in this scheme. And also one important point is to move from the intensity-based cap to absolute cap. That's quite important as well. And as was mentioned by Joss in the beginning, that um, the divergence, you know, the social, socioeconomic impact by these must also be taken into account because uh, China is a big country and there is a big difference between the regions in development, economic development. So just very quickly, it's a, a high level support uh, from Ch in China for the ETS, the carbon, the 2060 carbon neutrality uh, goal target is a game changer and it's also really uh, given a great momentum to climate change policies in China in general, and also in particular to the ETS. And also it's one of several policies. ETS is several one of several policies to, to address carbon emissions in, in China. So that should also be kept in mind. It's not the sole solution for China. Just finally, some references, if you're interested to read about uh, carbon markets, um, we have a book, uh, also a chapter on China and a couple of articles that are, um, you know, uh, by myself and uh, some colleagues at FNI. So thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Gohild. Now, Reginder Sahota will uh, discuss the California's uh, climate policy mix and the role of carbon pricing. Hello, um, thank you for the invitation to be here. And I'm hoping that uh, you can see my screen at this time. Yes, we do, perfect. Great, um, I just need to make sure I get my view back so that I can see the full view. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about the California climate policy. I will focus on the politics around our policies and also I will focus on the politics around my policies and also the design of the program. So in California, we do believe that there is an imperative to act that our economy and our public health and climate are all interrelated. We know that our low income households, our, our vulnerable communities are the least resilient in the face of climate change. We know that it has exacerbated respiratory illnesses that have made people more receptive to COVID-19 because of air quality issues related to climate. We've seen wildfires here and we've seen droughts that have hit our economy and, and caused damage and health impacts and mortality in the state. So how did California get to this place? Um, we had AB 32, a landmark global warming solution act signed in 2006. 
It was shepherded by our then governor, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he really had a global view. He is an international star, so of course he had lots of um, attention and he could bring a lot of that attention to climate change as the governor here in California. And so that law was signed in 2006 and it enabled for a significant amount of climate action, putting my agency, the California Air Resources Board, as the lead agency in implementing uh, large parts of that um, act. But in 2010, there was an effort by oil companies, oil companies that weren't just located in California, but other parts of the US, in particular in Texas, to try and suspend AB 32. And that was through a, a mechanism called Proposition 23. That went to the voters. And what it actually said was, if the, the employment rate dropped between a certain level, then we would suspend all climate action or had to stop, it had to drop below a certain level to continue to have action on climate. But if the employment rate was exceeding 5.5%, we could no longer have action on climate under that AB 32 law. When it went to the polls, 61.6% rejected that proposal and showed a strong support for climate action in California. And you can see at the bullets that it was opposed by venture capitalists and our large environmental NGOs. But it also showed that there was a strong social commitment in California to make sure that we took action on climate. So part of our establishing climate policy in California comes through a climate change scoping plan. There are actionable plans to ensure that we meet our reduction targets, and they have always relied on a suite of climate policies. So it's never just been one policy. Like Joss mentioned, there's complementary policies. This plan is updated at least once every five years. And our most recent update was in 2017, and it identified a cost-effective and technologically feasible path to achieve the 2030 target. Um, it is due for another update, and so I will talk about that later in the presentation. Uh, there's also statutory direction by our legislature that we deliver direct reductions in air quality benefits with our climate policies. We minimize emissions leakage, again, looking at how we give some allowances away in our ETS to achieve that objective. And we facilitate subnational and national collaboration. And that is why our program today in California is linked with Quebec's program in Canada. And so you have two subnational ETS systems that are fully fungible. They reside in one registry and our instruments, whether it's allowances or offsets can be used by uh, compliance entities in either region. And most importantly, the term cost effective with flexible compliance shows up in many statutes. And so achieving reductions at the least cost is a primary objective in all of California's policies. And the legislature has that phrase showing up multiple times. So it's good to see our trends. Um, we had a target in 2020 of returning to 1990 levels. Um, we hit that target in 2016. And what you can see on the graph on the, the right is the sources of emissions in California. We are dominated by transportation emissions which means that in our ETS, it was very important for us to include electricity, um, our commercial residential sectors, industry, and also transportation. And part of the industrial sector is also oil and gas extraction and refining. And when you add up the oil and gas extraction and refining um, with the transportation tailpipe emissions, more than 50% of California's greenhouse gases are from the transportation sector, so our ETS has always envisioned and included in 2015 um, our transportation sector emissions. And what you see on the left-hand side is that we saw our GDP grow, population grow, but our emissions, our emissions per capita and emissions per GDP declined through 2019. And we, it doesn't have the 2020 data and we saw steep reductions there obviously because of the shelter in place orders. So again, reinforcing that notion that uh, carbon pricing, cap and trade programs, ETSs reside within a portfolio approach. Our 2017 plan, um, which was aimed at getting a 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, includes a series of policies, energy efficiency, um, more renewable fuels, uh, and renewable power, our super pollutants such as fugitive emissions from dairies, landfills, and refrigerants, which are high global warming gases and short-lived climate pollutants, and then a cap on emissions for transportation industry, natural gas, and electricity, and that is an absolute cap. Um, a lot of the money that we generate from the ETS is used to make clean technology available um, to society. So we take money from our auctions, and not only do we do rebates for zero emission vehicles, but we support solar panels on housing, support transit systems, 
um, and support actions to manage our natural and working lands. And so that price on carbon is helping to implement and to reduce emissions through all these other policies that we have for other sectors. Uh, the cap and trade program when it launched, um, even though we made it through Prop 23 and it was widely supported, industry sued us several times. And so we had two lawsuits filed by industry and business uh, on the program. It was on the eve of the first auction. And then we also had a lawsuit by citizens who were concerned about offsets. And in all three of these lawsuits, we prevailed. So we litigated each of these and uh, the courts found in favor of uh, the state and how we designed and implemented the programs. But that was really the, the tenor at the beginning of the program, uh, industry pushback and then concerns over offsets. In uh, 2017, we also wanted to um, show that we had, um, you know, looked at other options. And so we looked at something with prescriptive regulations, a carbon tax, all cap and trade, cap and tax. And we looked at GDP, we looked at employment, we looked at um, uh, GDP, employment, and then household personal income. And what you see there is that the option, which is the proposed plan that included cap and trade, was the least one of the least option cost effect, uh, costly options to achieve the 2030 target. So that was a really good outcome in that we were able to show looking at a carbon tax at $50 a ton um, using a cap and tax scheme or all regulations that really going with that suite of policies and including cap and trade in the proposed plan was the best way to balance everything and achieve our objectives. In 2017, we also had a summer of wildfires and that was becoming a new norm here. We had an existing period of, we were exiting a period of severe drought. Um, climate change was on the minds of elected officials and our public. The scoping plan analyses demonstrate trade-offs for moving forward. And that was the previous slide where I showed, you know, cost effectiveness um, for the different uh, ways to get to 2030. And industry rallied around keeping the cap and trade program. So as I showed on that previous slide, because cap and trade with that suite of policies was the least costly way to achieve the targets, industry now rallied around the ETS and brought political support to then um, pass AB 398, which defined the role for the cap and trade program through 2030 with a majority vote. And so that was a big shift in thinking for our industry, realizing that the political support, the social support for addressing climate was there. So what was going to be the best way to get there and the least costly way for them to get there? everything pointed to a cap and trade program. And so even the people that had sued us, the industry groups that had sued us early on were part of the effort to push that AB 398 legislation here. So what does the program really look like? It covers 80% of the state's emissions. It covers about 450 entities, um, large industrial sources, generators, anyone with emissions over 25,000 metric tons of CO2 CO2E per year because we cover carbon, uh, NO2, N2O, or NO2, and then also methane. It covers electricity importers because California is a, is a huge consumer of electricity. A lot of it comes from out of state, almost 40% sometimes. Our natural gas suppliers and transportation fuel suppliers. Um, at the time that we did this presentation, we had held 31 auctions, they're quarterly. We had held joint auctions with Quebec since 2014. Um, and we had raised over $13 billion with over 50% of the investments from that money going back to our disadvantaged communities in the form of grants, rebates for energy efficiency, insulation for housing, solar panels, et cetera, and transit in those areas. But one of the points I really wanna stress here is that markets like certainty. And what you see here are the revenues that have been generated by our ETS. And you can see that in 2016, 2000, in Q2, Q3 of 2016, there was a drop in the revenues or a lack of interest in purchasing allowances at our auctions. And that really came about because there was a debate, a political debate going on in California about whether or not cap and trade should have a role for this decade. And that persisted through that summer. And once AB 398 was signed um, in 2017, Q2 2017, you started to see more regular interest, not only by compliance entities, who wanted to hedge, but also by um, voluntary participants like brokers and banks who saw opportunities here to be part of the market and add liquidity to the market. And then you fast forward again to Q1 of 2020, um, shelter in place due to the pandemic started in, in March and 
We saw the instability in financial markets and other regions come through into our auctions in California and Quebec and a decreased amount of interest in the auction in Q2 of 2020. Um, I will note that in our auctions, we have a price floor and every year that price floor increases by 5% plus inflation. And so we set the minimum at which we will sell allowances into the market as the state. Um, our most recent auction, which was about a month and a half ago, it had record highs and we made over a billion dollars. It was the first time the California Quebec auctions had raised over $1 billion in the history of the program. And so that renewed interest in carbon pricing, that certainty provided by the legislation and the ongoing climate impacts we are facing continues to send the signal to investors that yes, we need to keep addressing climate change. California is committed to that and that um, there is an opportunity to be part of that market and invest in this market. What we are going to do over this uh, next year is work on our carbon neutrality plan. So again, updating that scoping plan. And this is really looking at sources equaling sinks no later than mid-century. This is what the science says we have to do. Um, what you see there as the AB32 inventory sources, those are the sources we have fo focused on so far. Those are covered by our ETS. And we have been working to reduce emissions across all of those with that suite of policies. But when you think about carbon neutrality, we also wanna think about our natural working lands now. Um, in order to be part of our ETS, we do believe that we need uh, a more robust and accurate accounting to even try and think about pulling in natural working lands emissions into our ETS. But then there's also the balancing side with carbon capture and sequestration, direct air capture, and the potential for our natural working lands to not just be a source of emissions through wildfires and land conversion, but also a potential sink. So our focus will be in this plan to continue to reduce emissions from sources in that inventory, and that is continuing to look at the cap and trade program, our ETS here, how to take that money and make uh, clean technology, clean fuels accessible, um, how to mitigate uh, price impacts for low income households on energy rates, because we do give some form of rebate back on um, energy bills to, in California for the utilities that are part of our ETS program. And we will look at ways to reduce emissions and increase sequestration in natural working lands with the goal to maximize all sinks and achieve net negative no later than um, mid-century. So that process is underway and we hope to have that plan completed in the next um, 15 months. And with that, I will end my presentation and hand it back to Valeria, thank you. Thank you for this insightful information, Reginder. Now we're giving the floor to Marcos Castro that uh, he's presenting the progress of uh, carbon pricing in Latin America. Hello, can you see my screen now? Yes, perfectly. And uh, we can also hear you. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Sorry for this uh, delayed, delayed start. Thank you very much to Professor Beaton Coppin with the uh, Polycarbon team for this invitation to contribute to this panel discussion. I will give you a fairly uh, general overview of what is happening in the Latin America region in terms of carbon pricing. And so is the screen moving now? No. No. Oh. I'm so sorry for this. So uh, those who follow the World Bank's state and trends of the carbon pricing of the carbon markets will recognize this uh, map. It provides you an overview of what is happening. This is a snapshot of 2021 uh, map. And you will uh, see that in, as for the Americas, in the recent years, there has been an increasing adoption of domestic carbon pricing uh, instruments. We just heard from Hendra about the very important uh, 
California emissions trading system and the, <clears throat> also some of the developments in, 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 in all across uh, Canada through the pan-Canadian um, carbon pricing uh, uh, framework. As for Latin America, uh, there have been several uh, national jurisdictions that have been uh, adopting some price-based mechanism, uh, carbon taxes, and are now assessing some introduction of some supplementing supplemental quantity-based implement emissions trading systems. Uh, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, uh, and Argentina are those countries that have already introduced a carbon tax in the <clears throat> in, in over the last few, few years. In addition to that, there are some there are several other countries, including Brazil, but then also more recent developments in Peru and Central America, other countries uh, assessing uh, to introduce either an emission spraying system or a carbon tax. And without getting too much detail, uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the common uh, features of those countries that are, of the carbon pricing instruments that have been all, that are already operating in some of the LAC uh, uh, countries. As I mentioned, uh, Argentina, Colombia, Chile, and Mexico, they have already they have already a carbon tax in place for, for a few years. In all these countries, they took advantage of a political window of opportunity to introduce a carbon tax as part of, of, of a tax code reform and, and bill several years ago. With the exception of Chile, these are a taxes on the uh, fossil fuel consumption based on, on, on carbon content. In the case of Chile, uh, that's a, a tax actually on CO2 uh, uh, um, emissions. Um, something that we'll discuss also later on, uh, some of these countries, Colombia, Chile, Mexico, have provisions for the use of domestic carbon offsets as a part of, or as a flexibility uh, mechanism, uh, which uh, to, uh, will also generate, we anticipate some, some increasing demand for, for certified or for verified emissions reductions and, and uh, uh, from project activities, from mitigation project activities implemented in, 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 in those countries. And I also want to highlight that uh, in Colombia, Chile, Mexico, these uh, partners in the uh, Alianza del Pacifico, the Pacific Alliance, they've also uh, introduced in, uh, they have mandates in their climate change law in the case of Colombia and Mexico and have provisions in the climate change law that is being now right now discussed in, in, in Chile to supplement their carbon taxes with some other uh, carbon pricing instruments, specifically uh, uh, cap and trade uh, programs. In the case of Mexico, uh, they are already in the second year of a three-year pilot program of, of, of a simple uh, ETS pilot program, but everybody anticipates that this will then transition into a, a full-fledged emissions trading system starting 2023. Uh, Colombia has a, a, a bit of more, more generous timeline and they are now working on the design of a pilot program, probably to be launched 2023 or 2024. Um, among the many uh, features of this carbon pricing instrument, domestic carbon pricing instruments. Um, and we've heard, heard uh, uh, that discussion, how, how uh, significant is the price signal coming from this uh, uh, carbon pricing instruments to really uh, push for a transition into a low carbon uh, growth? There will be different uh, arguments in terms of starting too low or, or uh, too high. I do think at the end of the day, it reflects what is uh, the political economy niche of these uh, countries. But just to highlight that at this point, uh, the, the tax rate of, of, of these carbon taxes is a, a, a still at a fairly low uh, level, at least compared to what would be needed to be aligned with this long-term goal of uh, reaching net zero by 2050, which by the way, uh, several of these countries have already also pledged to, to, to to meet. On what is still coming, this is just a snapshot of the countries that we've been working over the last few years as part of the Partnership for Market Readiness. We recently launched a second phase of this program, very successful program, uh, the Partnership for Market Implementation. But just to illustrate that uh, beyond these countries that have already had an explicit carb domestic carbon pricing uh, instrument in place, several other countries 
are actively not only assessing, but also uh, working on some enabling activities to be able to introduce in the near or midterm uh, some of uh, similar in, uh, instruments. They're working on, on, on building uh, MRV infrastructures uh, in, in developing some, some analytical assessments to, to inform the, decision, the discussions and the, and, and the decisions by, by, by policymakers about the introduction of this, of this carbon pricing uh, instruments. As I mentioned, Brazil, uh, Peru, in Central America, Costa Rica, Panama, some of the, the, those countries that uh, are also taking a closer look at the introduction of domestic carbon pricing uh, instruments. For the region, something that is equally uh, uh, of, of, of interest is access to international carbon markets. And I'm missing right now a bit of an overview of what is happening in terms of <clears throat> voluntary carbon markets. As, as, as you know, that region is also uh, uh, one of the um, important regions in supplying uh, emissions reductions, particularly from, 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 from uh, the forest sector. One quite interesting development we've seen in the last couple of years is the emergence and, and, and uh, actually operation of voluntary carbon market, uh, sorry, voluntary greenhouse gas management programs, uh, carbon target programs in different countries, which do have this uh, a very important contribution of generating some, some, some installing capacities and generating some, 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 some culture around uh, a corporate reporting of, of of, of emissions in that way, also introducing some of the basic uh, <clears throat> elements for what could evolve into a, a mandatory reporting of emissions that at the same time is a corner store for any uh, domestic uh, carbon pricing uh, instruments for any compliance uh, mechanism. Uh, and also these programs are generating some demand, some domestic demand for uh, uh, offsets not in a large amount, but in any case, generating some, 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 some uh, activities in, uh, uh, around um, verified emissions reduction, uh, um, emission redu verified emission reductions generated in, 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 in national or domestic uh, mitigation projects. Just to find a, a, a few general, very general observations as, 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 as noted, in lag region, as in the rest of the world, carbon pricing is expanding. There have been some very important developments over the last two or three years, uh, and more are coming. Important to highlight uh, anchored in climate law, so with a very strong uh, <clears throat> uh, mandate to, 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 to go ahead with design and implementation of, of these instruments. However, challenges still remain in lag region. There are still gaps in terms of the mitigation ambition reflected, for instance, in, in, in price level when it's a price-based instruments or the cap in, 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 in plant emissions trading system, also in coverage. Uh, in, in this, uh, all these instruments uh, have only uh, limited uh, coverage for the focus in, in power generation and, and, and industrial um, sector, in the industrial sector. Um, the very important role of carbon pricing as an, very impo as an important policy instrument, not only if, uh, to contribute to mitigation objectives, but also, for instance, as an alternative uh, source to raise uh, revenues and contribute to a sustainable uh, uh, recovery. And uh, ultimately, uh, as we've been uh, discussing the choice of instrument, uh, uh, you can see in, in, the, in, in the region really depends on, on the more specific policy objectives and the circumstances in each of the uh, uh, jurisdictions. There clearly, there's clearly no, no silver bullet uh, and countries are, are, are not only choosing the instrument, but also the, the specific design reflects the local and national priorities. That's it for the time being. Uh, here I have included some the link to some of the uh, more recent publications from the PMR uh, that aim at supporting the different design uh, steps for uh, of a carbon pricing instrument, be it an emissions trading system or a carbon tax or a domestic trading instrument. Thank you. Thank you for your informative presentation, Marcus.
Next, uh, Professor Dr. Johan Lillistam is going to explain if and how carbon pricing plays a role in uh, climate policy mixes. Thanks, Marco. It would be great if you could stop your presentation so that I can share my slides. Sorry for that. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thank you. I will see if I find the correct ones. Should be something like this. For now, of course, I cannot see my own slides. So it will take one second. Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. So thanks for this. So I will be doing a very different talk than the previous ones because I will be not looking at a specific scheme, but rather to look at the question that, as I understood it for this entire workshop, what, what could be the role of carbon pricing in a policy mix for full decarbonization? So what, what could we need to use this for and what can we perhaps not use this, uh, this instrument for? I'm going to take a very different approach uh, than what we've seen before, also from what uh, uh, what Joe said in the beginning, uh, coming to entirely different conclusions. For example, I, I don't agree that we need a carbon price. Uh, we could have it, and the question is not we, that we need it, but what do we need it for? And uh, as I will show in the first part of my presentation, so I, I, I fundamentally agree I with that. Uh, Johan, we can yes. see your slides. Uh, we can you see cannot see my slides. Yeah, we see that uh, you started scary, sharing the screen, uh, but uh, not the slides. No, but that's because I haven't clicked anything yet. Oh, okay. Good to know. Thanks. <laughs> right. So, I mean, we see that emissions go down, but we do not see that they go down because of the European Emission Trading Scheme. And these are the things I hope that we will then dive into. Because what you could get, you could easily get the impression when looking at these debates on climate policy, listening into seminars like, like the one today, that it's really uncontroversial that we do need a carbon price and, and, and then we're more or less fine. But this is not true. There is big controversy of the usefulness and necessity of carbon pricing. So for example, we've been involved in this debate for, for several years. We published one of, the, one of the first conceptual theoretical pieces on, on why carbon pricing not only does not work, but why it cannot work together uh, independently with another colleague, Jeffrey Ball from, from Stanford. This was met with quite some hostility by environmental economists, in this case from Vienna. A year later, colleagues from, uh, from uh, Canada picked this up and put this critique against carbon pricing more squarely in the theoretical framing of translation studies. This was not at all positively received, and the response was also not positively received by these other people. Earlier this year, uh, we presented uh, another study looking at the empirical evidence of what do we know about the effectiveness of carbon pricing, and I'll be presenting this uh, in, in a second. Last week, this was not met with, with a lot of, <laughs> of, of pleasant comments. And um, so there are two points that I want to make here. First of all, it's not at all clear that we need carbon pricing. And for all the students here, and I've learned that there are, most of the attendees are actually students, I would absolutely recommend to look, have a look at these articles, the original ones and the responses, in order to be able to have a creative and intelligent view on, on, on this and really see what is going on here. And you can make up your own mind of the necessity of this. But our work, is really based on, on, on the necessities coming out of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement means that we need to come to climate neutrality, and we can discuss the exact year, but let's assume for now that it's 2050. We know that climate neutrality requires very deep structural change. We cannot just do incremental changes on, on the edges. We need to really create an entirely new way of, of, of energy production and energy consumption. We need new infrastructure. We need, we need new, essentially, everything. The, the, the time of tinkering on the edges has, has passed. And this means that what we really need to meet the, carb the Paris Agreement is zero carbon investments and a lot of that. So this is really the benchmark against which we need to measure um, any carbon pricing. Does it trigger zero carbon investment? Yes or no? And if yes, then it's potentially helpful. And if no, it's absolutely not sufficient. And then the question is, is it helpful? to support other instruments or not, but if it doesn't trigger zero carbon investments, it's not really at least the only thing we need and it's not a necessary policy. So we looked at the empirical evidence of, of what do we know about this? And we looked at uh, a set of, of the ex post empirical literature that exists. And one of the more surprising things is that although this instrument has existed for over 30 years, there's very little empirical evidence of, of its effectiveness. Does it work? And we don't really know that. We found 19 articles. Since then, there have been two more published. 
Um, but the evidence about this is relatively thin. That's the first conclusion. If we then look at what are the effects, we see that it's relatively bleak. So all the gray things are all the types of, of factors that people didn't investigate. But we see there's a lot of red where people have found that this instrument has had no effect on the different types of decarbonization um, aspects. So let's have a look more detail at all of this. So typically, when you have carbon pricing, you think, well, it's going to reduce our emissions. And here we see that, uh, in particular for the EU ETS, but um, also for some other taxing systems, we see that the general conclusion is that it has had no effect. Um, so it has not reduced emissions. But there are a set of studies, and these are the most recent studies, and I don't think that's a coincidence, um, because carbon, pricing has, carbon prices have been higher in later years. And these studies are all at the bottom. They, show in, they are shown in green, and they show that there are some quite strong effects, or so the authors themselves claim that there are strong effects of carbon pricing. And if we look closer to that, we see, for example, for Sweden, which has the highest carbon tax of all countries, what they find there is a 6 to 11% emission reduction over 15 years. So something of one third to, to two thirds of a percent emission reduction uh, compared to a, a situation where Sweden would not have this uh, carbon tax. Mind you, the emissions in Sweden in the, in the transport sector, in, in this case, it keeps on increasing, but it would have increased even more without this carbon tax. And we have a set of studies from British Columbia, and they also show that emissions do decrease after the introduction of the carbon tax by something like mine, uh, one to eight percent emission reduction compared to before and, and after the introduction of this tax. If we look at why the emissions decrease, these studies don't really say explicitly, but looking at the graphs. Johan, apologies yes. to interrupt you again, but we still cannot see your slides. So can you stop the this? Is, this is truly weird. Sharing for a moment and mm, yes, it. I will do it again. Now that's that's very troubling <laughs> and also strange. That never happened to me. It says it's paused. Can you see it now? Now we see it. Ah, I wish you had <laughs> not stopped Thank me too you. early and then too late. Okay, anyway, this is at least what we can see, right? So we see um, down at the bottom here, we see these green things. We see the effect on emissions. This is the column that is now uh, hopefully shown to you. We see some emission reductions, but if we look into these studies, why do emissions decrease? Then we see that the, the reason why emissions decrease is because we see a shift from gasoline cars to diesel cars. And diesel is a little bit less carbon intensive than gasoline, so that's why emissions decrease, and they can decrease by, by as we see, a quite a few uh, percentage points. But I would argue this is absolutely not a climate policy because diesel is also a fossil fuel, and if for the aim of full decarbonization, a shift to diesel is just not helpful. So that's what we can see that there are effects on emissions, but they come from the wrong reasons. So they're ultimately not helpful for the goal of, of full decarbonization. And if we look at the two factors that would be helpful for full decarbonization, and in particular, the effects on zero carbon investment, we see a very bleak picture. We see that there is very little evidence overall. We don't really know much about this issue. We find no evidence at all that carbon pricing has triggered zero carbon investments anywhere in the world at any time. And we see some, invest, some evidence that there have been no investments triggered. So what we see is we have an instrument that does have some effects, but it has none of the effects that we would actually need. So then the question comes, if it does not trigger zero carbon investments, and then it's not a necessary tool. But still, maybe there is a role for carbon pricing in the policy mix. And I think there are, and I think there are exactly two reasons to have carbon pricing in the policy mix. The first one is to fund other more effective climate policies. These are things that we also see in South America, in, in Latin America in particular, in Colombia, for example, where they raise money through this in order to spend it on energy efficiency measures. That could be one use. And the other one is to use carbon pricing as a decline policy, not to get the new stuff in, but to get the old stuff out. So let's look just briefly at these two points. And the easiest point is, of course, the first one to use carbon pricing to raise other, uh, other, other funds for other policies. And we know that many of the transition policies that we're going to need, they're going to be policy support for insulation or for infrastructure or for train tracks or for bike lanes or, or whatever. And they're necessary. This type of public expenditures are going to be absolutely necessary, but they're also going to be very expensive. So this is a big problem. And here, global carbon taxing or carbon taxing 
could, could help. It doesn't have to be global at all. And just very simply say, assuming that we tax all CO2 emissions by 50 euros per ton, then we would raise one and a half trillion euros per year. And I think we can all agree that this is a lot of money and we can do a lot of things with this money. So this is sort of a no brainer that this is a type of policy that we can use to raise these types of funds. And we need to figure out what are these more effective climate policies to get in the new stuff. The other type of, pull of, of role I think carbon pricing can play in a policy mix is to work as a decline policy. As I said, to get the old stuff out, to get coal out, to get combustion cars out and so on. And we can see the we can see effects. We can see empirically that this is actually working. And we can see this, for example, in the EU ETS. And this is the reason why many people say that the EU ETS is now finally working. It's finally showing some effects. And here is the, uh, the power mix of, of Germany. Um, oh, apologies, it's still in German, but I hope you can figure it out. The green ones are renewables, and then uh, the darker black it gets, the more, <laughs> the more uh, fossil um, it is. So what we can see here is that the power mix in Germany is changing. It is changing, first of all, because there is a support policy, the renewable energy law, uh, that triggers investments in renewables. But we can also see um, somewhere here, right? In 2018, when the EU ETS price started increasing, we can see there is a sharp bend in the black curve, which is coal, hard coal. And we can see that the carbon price really does help to push up coal because it shifts the merit order. It pushes out coal and puts it behind gas in, in, in the merit order. And then in an increasing number of hours over the year, coal is just not in the system anymore. And then coal goes out and emissions go down, exactly the effect that, that we would, would hope for. But it only works because there are alternatives. Gas is growing and the renewables are growing, supported by entirely other policies. We see a similar effect in the UK. And here, when I mean, this example was touted very much last year, when coal really disappeared from the, from the British power system, I think it is quite different this year, but, but that happened last year. And here we can see the yellow curve. For whatever reason, coal is yellow in, in this graph. We can see that the coal, it's going along, bumbling along, and then it just plummets and disappears. And what happened there is the combined effect of two policies. First, we had regulatory policy, environmental policy. The British closed, uh, well, some, a little bit more than half of their coal fleets because they opted out of the large combustion engine uh, directive, so sulfur regulation. But at the same time, they also introduced the CO2 price price. And these two policies together essentially squeezed out coal because there was already a fleet of gas power to take over and the renewable fleet was also growing at the, moment, at the same time. So the combination of these two decline policies and the existence of a big gas fleet and the increase of renewables together led to the collapse of coal, which is a very good thing. So this is something that, that many people in the, in the literature have found that Carbon pricing can induce significant abatement if there is an alternative out there. And I would just like to hypothesize that this works in general, not only for the electricity sector, that a carbon price can help push out carbon intensive assets if and as soon as other policies have created a viable, attractive alternative that is present and ready for very large scale deployment. So we can expect to see the same thing in the car sector, for example, as soon as the electric car is as attractive as the internal combustion engine car is today. And that means as soon as we have pushed down prices for, for cars, as long as the reach is long, and as, as soon as we have sufficiently many chargers and it's sufficiently easy to use them, then it's going to work. Then this carbon price could work in combination with these other policies. Before that, we shouldn't expect to see any effect at all. So this is really what I believe is the role of carbon pricing to use it to fund other more effective climate policies and to use it in combination with other policies as a decline policy. But having it only as, as the single instrument, as the lead instrument is hardly going to work. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. We surely listened to a very relevant presentation. And uh, now, uh, Bianca G. Chanji will talk about the role of alliances for carbon pricing in Eastern Africa. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great, great, okay. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much for having me uh, today and for letting me present 
um, on what's been happening in Eastern Africa on the side of carbon pricing. And uh, my name is Bianca Gishangi, and I'm the coordinator for the Eastern Africa Alliance on Carbon Markets and Climate Finance. And today I'll be speaking about the role um, this alliance plays in, um, in the region. And to kick us off, I'll just give a bit of a background and uh, understanding as to why this alliance is there in the first place. And a lot of Eastern African countries have mentioned in their NDCs that they would like to use market mechanisms towards uh, their NDC implementation. And a lot of them have participated in the Kyoto Protocol before through the CDM. And they're keen to see how they can partake in what the Paris Agreement has to offer under Article 6. And there is a need though for African countries and specifically where I'm from, it's Eastern Africa, for them to participate and shape uh, the design of this new generation of market mechanisms that are coming out. So they need to have a strong say in what's happening in their negotiations that are happening right now under Article 6. So about the Alliance itself, it was launched in June of 2019. So we're just slightly over two years old. And the membership is country driven. And this is uh, Burundi, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and Sudan. And how it operates really is based on the requests that the Alliance members put forward. And then those now form the activities of the Alliance. And the main aim actually of the Alliance is just to make sure that there's long-term participation of these countries in carbon market activities and to strengthen the capacities of members um, in the region and to access climate finance as well. So that now leads us to the objectives. Uh, as I've mentioned already, it's about enhancing readiness for the new coming um, mechanisms into place. So it revolves around a lot of capacity building, a lot of trainings, a lot of workshops, and then it also involves supporting uh, the coordination of uh, negotiators, African negotiators um, at these delegations, but also to help them be able to understand a lot about the subject matter so that they can inform their national positions and then use that to be able to contribute to the AGN strategy when, <clears throat> when we do go to the climate change negotiations and the COP. So that's during the SB sessions in the middle of the year and the COP at the end of the year as well. And then the Alliance also now promotes regional collaboration through sharing of these experiences uh, with each other. So with the different country experiences. And we also collaborate a lot with uh, West Africa where they have a similar alliance and that we borrow from because it's a bit older. So we get a lot of inspiration from what they've done even though we have very different um, countries and very different experiences we do find commonalities and situations where there is opportunity to learn from each other, especially in this area of um, carbon pricing. So lastly, we also uh, help with mobilizing on climate finance, though I'll, I'll stick to the main issues today on markets and carbon taxation. So I think just to give a bit of an overview, uh, because I know the, the reputation that, um, the reputation that carbon markets has had in Africa has been quite small. There's a lot of uh, criticism in terms of not resulting in sustainable development with the CDM, but there has actually been some activity and I'll just expand on some of that activity that took place. And there has been about 465 registered activities. Bearing in mind, this is from uh, carbon market uh, profiles we developed for each of the members um, earlier on in the year around April. So the numbers could have gone up. And what we saw is that, you know, we had 53 project activities, but we also had 58 programs of um, activities, POAs, with about 412 CPAs. And what we'll notice is that about 96% uh, of these POAs were registered after 2012. So after the whole uh, price of the CR market uh, dipped, and uh, you did see a rise in POA activity in Africa, even though little was going on before then. So that was something positive on the side. So a lot of the activity was in um, electricity generation, um, electric energy access, and water purification. But the region also had quite a bit of activity in the voluntary carbon markets. In fact, the issuance from the voluntary carbon market is a lot higher than, than what was seen under CDM. And what we saw, um, as I was saying earlier, is that CDM had a lot of activity in energy generation, cook stoves, and water purification. Gold standard had a lot of um, had a lot of experience in cook stoves and uh, Vera and Plan Vivo had a lot of um, projects in forestry. 
So that's just setting the scene to understand um, uh, where we're coming from and where we're going. So of course, there's a lot more you can look into the profiles to decipher on what went wrong or what went right. Uh, but definitely it could be better. And that's uh, something that we want to look at moving forward in Article 6 to make sure that we're not late to, to, to getting into, into the activities and benefiting from it. So it's been two years with the, with the Alliance so far, and we've been establishing uh, what we can do uh, on a recurring basis, but also new activities that depend on the requests that are coming in from the members. And what we've established is the pre-COP negotiators training. So this is more hands-on where we take the negotiators through all the, the, the issues that are being deliberated on an international platform to make sure that they understand what the issue is and then they understand their priorities and what uh, position that they are taking. So as I mentioned before, we do this before the SBs and then we do this uh, before the COP. So we're having our session actually next week with uh, the regional negotiators on this. But then we also realize that there's a lot of private sector involvement because of that portfolio that I mentioned beforehand. There are a lot of stakeholders still in the region, still trying to understand what is Article 6 going to do for us? Like, how is it going to affect us? Can we keep waiting? Like, what are our options? And then just understanding whether, you know, issues such as corresponding adjustments will affect them. So what we do is really make sure that we keep them up to date on what's happening in the negotiations and what's happening in the voluntary carbon markets as well, because that is um, a big part of the portfolio as well. And we had this uh, quite recently in September, so the 21st to the 23rd, and that's been recurring as well. We'll have one again um, after the call. But something interesting that has actually come out from what we've been seeing um, as we get more engagement from the members and more of a proactive um, attitude towards this, this mechanisms is we're getting very practical requests. So like one of the requests we got from one of the countries was on doing a corresponding adjustments training. And um, I, um, I don't know how familiar, if we are familiar with um, Article 6 or not, but in a, in a, to, to oversimplify it, it's basically uh, Corresponding adjustments were agreed on by parties to, to use them for double counting, to avoid double counting, but the intricacies on how to do this, on how to, um, you know, on, 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 on what methods to use, those details, there's, there's been a lot of discussion around that, there's been a lot of um, disagreement in certain things, but they are very keen on being able to implement these market mechanisms, but with proper accounting rules. So even though there's no decision, it doesn't stop you from trying to explore the options that are being put forward already. Uh, so that way, once um, a decision comes in, you're at least more likely to know where you would be um, going with your procedure development and your templates and whatever is needed to actually implement an Article 6. So we've had we've had that session uh, pretty recently in uh, September, but it's not, sorry, that date is wrong. That's for the private sector dialogue. But um, we had that before the private sector dialogue, so around the 14th. And basically, it just shows us that um, they, 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 they want to be a bit more proactive and not caught off guard once this thing starts. And then something else that also popped up was a request uh, that was asking for a carbon markets training, but for youth, particularly for a youth audience. And a lot of them were young professionals. And aside from wanting to know what carbon markets were and how you know it had it had worked in that country, I mean, Eastern Africa it's primarily through offsets, um, but uh, it, ideally they wanted to understand where are the career options for, for us? Where, what, how can, as a young person, how can I actually plug into this? Uh, and what we did is we also had a lot of presentations from people who are experienced in, um, so like auditors, uh, verification auditors, consultants, who are actually from the country and to just show them that there is an opportunity to have a very local uh, skill set to, to be able to participate in carbon markets and make it sustainable because that was a challenge. Having projects, um, getting all the way to issuance was, was, was a difficulty. You get registered, but there's no one to monitor. You can't pay the verification costs. And some of these things can be reduced if we have your own local consultancies, you have your own regional DOEs. And some of these are some, so we need to actually look at this as somewhere where they can actually get um, job opportunities and, and the career path. So 
I, just moving slightly from carbon markets, uh, there is also um, carbon pricing, but from the angle of uh, carbon taxation. And the thing is with African countries, only one is implementing a carbon tax right now, South Africa, and it took them uh, quite a long time. And I think it was important for our members and the West African members to really understand what is involved in actually developing um, a carbon tax. You don't just do it overnight. There's a lot of stakeholders involved. There's a lot that goes into the design. And Africa also is very different from the rest of the world in terms of how um, its different sectors operate. So what we did is we had an online carbon tax course and it was designed for the African context. And each mod we had like six modules and uh, five, five of those always had a guest speaker who was from um, a specific African country that has explored it to some extent and giving their, 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 their examples and their, their, their understanding on certain issues. So we had uh, case, uh, cases from like South Africa, from Senegal, from Ethiopia, and it really just made them um, understand that they can look at it from their own national perspectives and see if it's what they really need. And it went through all the different stages in designing it. And it was for six uh, weeks for these modules online. And now we've made it um, those resources uh, publicly available. Um, and it's it actually took a lot of collaborating to get this course done. So we collaborated with the West African Alliance. Uh, we had some support from SIACA, which is um, the Collaborative Instruments for Ambitious Climate Action, a program managed by the UNFCCC, uh, BOAD, which is the West African Development Bank, the RCCs, and then of course, St. George's University that was so gracious in um, helping us host up the site. And this is just because of the way we, we collaborate within regions. So East Africa, West Africa, the Caribbean, there's RCCs all over. So we do have a good network to, to tap into as well. And now these resources are available uh, publicly. So if anyone would like to understand a bit more how it would be for an African country to do this, then they can, they can take this course as well. And then now on the, on the on the platform of now having like actual governments coming together to speak on carbon pricing initiatives uh, a lot of our focal points took part in the regional dialogues on carbon pricing they're called the ready cap sessions uh, so this was sharing of best practice across africa in a safe space just identifying the challenges that are being faced but also trying to see if you can have a roadmap um, on how to incorporate these sorts of instruments um, into into strategy and, and uh, policy moving forward. So very, okay, I, I hope I'm not, uh, just let me know if I'm running up um, late on time, but just, uh, we also do a lot of knowledge products and the whole, uh, the whole point is to just make sure this information gets out to as many people as possible within the region. And uh, so we developed a handbook for negotiators for Article 6 in Eastern Africa. And it's actually being translated now into Spanish and French and, uh, with our connections in uh, the Caribbean as well. So it's something that is definitely going to expand beyond. And it's really important, especially before we go to COP26 right now, just to everybody to have a refresher on what the issues are and just to make sure that um, African voice is at the table when these things are being discussed. And then we, as, as I mentioned before, we did the carbon market profiles, which we keep updating. And we always try to keep this information um, on our website. The handbook as well will be updated based on a decision at COP26 or not. And then, um, so, so basically these resources can keep getting updated to become more accessible to the rest of the region. And then lastly, uh, we did a, an assessment for each of the countries, just to understand what their readiness would be for Article 6. And of course, that was based a lot on their readiness for the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism. So and identifying the institutional um, gaps, the legal gaps, and the infrastructure gaps, because it's going to be a lot of uh, reporting, the transferring of ITMOs, and if countries decide to, to apply corresponding adjustments or not as well. So in terms of core activities, that's how we're always trying to make sure that this capacity and the knowledge is always there so that we can't say that we didn't know what's going on. But we also have a lot of regional collaboration, as I mentioned. So we've been doing a lot of uh, events and, and dialogues, actual regional dialogues where we bring together uh, cooperative approaches. So under Article 6, you have what, uh, under 6.2, we have cooperative approaches. And what's happening is there are a lot of 
different pilots coming up. And what we did is we brought all these different um, initiatives that are coming up together, uh, brought our members together as well. And then now they can really iron out the issues and discuss what is really needed to actually implement these things. And some of the things we've seen is that some countries are actually doing bilateral agreements so that they can kickstart a lot of this activity quickly. And what does that what does that mean for all these other approaches as well? And like, what are we actually learning from these pilots um, moving forward? So we've been holding a lot of these dialogue sessions just to make sure that the government officials are up to date on what's actually going on uh, globally. And then uh, Africa Climate Week, we've had uh, events together as well. We do have events at the I4C, at IETA, and CPLC. We are a member of the CPLC. So we do try to contribute to the Africa Working Group on that as well. So I'll, I'll wrap up there, but that just will give you an idea as to why um, this alliance is important because the more requests we're getting, a lot of them are replicable to all the countries. And when they are very country specific, we implement the activity and we see if we can replicate it uh, large scale. So either way, the messages are being spread around and what we're hoping to see is a lot more activity um, this time around. Yeah, so thank you. Um. Thank you for your perspective, Bianca. Now we can conclude the round of presentations uh, with uh, Damien Meadows, uh, who will speak about climate action uh, in the European Union. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I've just got a couple of slides because I anticipate we, we might be running a slightly over schedule with the interesting uh, presentation so far. So if I can go straight to the first slide, uh, Valeria, please. Um, just beyond this. Um, I mean, the question is, can pricing carbon drive action towards net zero by 2050? And here, I mean, my answer would be an unequivocal yes. Um, the President of the European Commission has been very simple and blunt, uh, saying carbon emissions must have a price and every sector has to contribute. It was said in a much more uh, long-winded, eloquent way by Barack Obama in terms of tilting the level playing field to make it profitable for companies to pollute less. Um, we need these changes to happen. Um, I would very much, I mean, I've enjoyed the, the presentation so far, and I would take up on what Bianca said about context differ. Um, Africa is in its own situation, different parts of Africa. Uh, Europe is in its own situation. In the United States, they have had troubles at fed federal level trying to have a, a national carbon pricing system. So it's not necessarily possible to do this uh, in all regions of the world. But where you can, I, I consider it pretty clear that it does help you reach net zero. Um, I'll defer to Professor Jos Delbeck here in terms of the books on this slide, as, as he's the editor of both of them. Uh, we have 16 years experience here in Europe and we're keen to share this experience, whether it's in East Africa, whether it's in China, whether it's uh, Korea um, or Japan. I mean. Parts of the world will design their own carbon pricing if they do this. Um, a border measure, I think I saw in the questions, this can encourage countries like Russia to, to develop carbon pricing. But ultimately, in the world we live in, it requires a, a level of interest and um, action from governments themselves. So if I can go to the, the next and final slide, there's quite a lot of detail on this one. Europe. Um, I think is very clearly heading towards economy-wide climate neutrality. Um, we know we need this to avoid climate change. And I mean, Rajinda was talking about the wildfires in California. We've had these in Greece, in Turkey, we've had the floods in Belgium. The, the world is seeing uh, extreme weather, um, which amply shows that, that we need to act, uh, reduce emissions, um, because we're only gonna face worse through, through our lifetimes. Um, I'm glad that European heads of state have recognized this, that they're committed to climate uh, neutrality and that we have a climate law in Europe saying that economy wide, uh, we must reduce emissions to zero by 2050. And importantly, with a short term target that we are to be at least 55% below 1990 levels by the year 2030. 
it, it's easy to have far off targets. It's also easy just to focus on some sectors. Um, in Europe, the electricity sector was key for wanting predictability for the transformation that has to happen. They supported carbon pricing. I've worked with the aviation sector who, who when it came down to it were slightly more troubling in terms of actually getting a meaningful price signal in place. And this is still ongoing work. So economy wide, I think is really important. We can't just look at those sectors who are producing the renewables and so on. This is important, but we need to get efforts across the economy. Um, and this is where Professor Lilia Stam, in terms of whether carbon pricing works. Um, I mean, I, I come at this as a mere lawyer. I, I've worked on carbon pricing, uh, European climate policy for the last 20 years. Um, I've never seen ETS as the sole measure. And I understand that economically, it's difficult to disaggregate um, every single influence on companies' decisions. But I find it hard to believe that a 60 euro carbon price isn't uh, steering companies in the right direction uh, compared to not having such a price. And, it, and if you look at the ferocity of airline lobbying against, say, the EU ETS, but then it seems to me that there must be something behind this. It must be giving incentives to reduce emissions. Um, now, um, th there's four elements here I'd like to mention because I think it's important to go to the Q&A. Um, we, we as the European Commission, we produced proposals to member states and the European Parliament in July. Um, these proposals, uh, the key environmental outcome is to reduce European emissions by 55% below 2030 levels by, um, so by 2030, 55% below 1990 levels. Um, and in the emissions trading system, what we're proposing is a straight line trajectory taking effect uh, from this year in terms of the way it's proposed in the legislation. So I, I, I've seen people criticizing 2050 targets for being far in the future. I, I think if you only have a 2050 target and no action, then obviously that's um, not positive. But this must be accompanied by action, and it is in Europe. Um, we're also improving the market stability reserve. I mean, the ETS has been improved a lot over the years, but in more depth than I'm able to talk about in this session, unless there's questions. Professor Liliastam, you did say that um, a carbon price is useful if it generates money to pursue other policies. In my, in my perspective, the ETS has always generated revenues, and these revenues have been used to do climate action. Member states today are reporting that 75% of this money, at least, is used to tackle climate change. And since 2012, the EU ETS has raised $90 billion. Um, and this money is paying for wind farms, biorefineries, uh, solar plants, all kinds of things around Europe. So we have an innovation fund. Uh, we're expanding this innovation fund. It could be worth 30 billion euros. Um, I, I, the more studies, the better, I guess, on the economic side. But ETS is one policy among a range, and it generates the money that pays for action elsewhere in the economy. I mean, this, this happens both through the innovation fund and member states' use of revenue. We also have an enormous modernization fund, which was important for countries like Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary in terms of making the changes and also the social changes for reducing emissions while improving the economy. So there's an awful lot of detail here, an awful lot of fine tuning that we proposed in July. Uh, if people are interested in free allocation for hydrogen production, things like this, I'm very happy to answer questions. But I would say that where you can do carbon pricing, and Europe has succeeded in doing this, then it helps you bring down emissions, uh, not least by the use of revenues. And I note that Rajinda was saying the same thing in California. I, I mean, to look at it in the abstract, I think, takes away from the whole. My third point is on broader coverage. Um, for me, the maritime sector had always been a placebo <laughs> in terms of seeing what happens without carbon pricing. And the answer to this placebo test was that emissions continued to increase. 
there's, there's obviously a change from coronavirus, which has changed the whole world we live in. But it's recognized you need to price heavy fuel oil um, if you want to move to renew, renewable methanol, uh, batteries, other sorts of fuels. This is an essential component to make it have a payback period to reduce emissions. So in Europe, we're looking at broadening the coverage of our ETS, but in a way that very much takes account of common but differentiated responsibilities. Um, another issue well worth studying, uh, we're taking responsibility for half of the emissions here, but under Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, then Ghana, China, Australia, these are responsible for the other half, and for de developing countries, they're not obliged to do this immediately. We're also having broader action on aviation, but without backsliding. It's been a big effort for Europe to price aviation emissions. Uh, it's encouraging efficiency, improvements, all these things. And um, we're not planning to backslide on what we have now, but we are planning to uh, apply an offset based system from the International Civil Aviation Organization to European airlines for their international flights. And we hope that the United States and others will implement this too. Um, we're proposing a separate ETS to price emissions from road and buildings with a social climate fund to help pay for, for um, actions in terms of insulation, actions in terms of sustainable mobility. So carbon pricing, I think, where you can do it is an essential component of um, reaching net zero. Uh, at the federal level in the US, I think that's a special situation. You have companies who argue that you should only have ETS and not have other measures. Now, I didn't hear that today from Yoss when he did the introduction, nor from Rajinda. And from myself, uh, as my fourth point here, I would highlight this clear commission from the state, say clear statement from the commission that we need urgent economy wide emission reductions, and that even in heavy industry, there should be able to be other policies than purely ETS. So there's a very particular American discussion, I think, where it said that if you have carbon pricing, you shouldn't have any other policies whatsoever. Now, that's a situation which might cause harm to the climate because the other policies could have been effective. But that is not at all the situation we have in the 30 countries applying the EU ETS because the EU ETS is one of a suite of policies, but it really is quite an important one in terms of the 60 euro carbon price signal it gives today, the 4.2% uh, annual reductions it should be bringing from when the revisions enter into force, and this very large quantity of auction revenue, which so far, I mean, most of it has been used to tackle climate change, and this delays proposals, um, include sort of strengthening that so that the ETS is funding a, a large element of, of other policies to reduce emissions in Europe. So I, I think I'll stop there given the time. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Just to say um, the European Commission proposes these things, they will now be decided upon by the European Parliament and by our member states in council. So there's a one or two year process before these become European laws. Thank you very much and uh, over to the Q&A. Thank you for your perspective, Damien, and uh, thank you once again to all of our speakers. So we listen to a regionally diverse uh, range of presentations uh, on the topic of carbon pricing uh, with the mentions of net zero. Now we're opening the floor to the questions from the audience. Please uh, submit your questions in the chat box, uh, chat box uh, here on Zoom, and uh, we will receive them, ask them to our panelists, uh, and uh, in case your questions are directed to a specific range of panelists or one specific one, please uh, specify that in your submission. Olivia, so, there, there are a bunch of questions there already, but they sort of disappear when someone types an answer to them. So, so in that sense, I think Damien and I destroyed the Q&A session already before it started. Yes, no, luckily we managed to save them uh, on the side. So there were actually a couple of questions that we thought uh, could be interesting to bring up to more than one speaker. For example, here there was um, one question that um, to you, Johan, and uh, also to Damien, it would be interesting to, to hear your, your answer about um, 
And the cap how cap and trade practically assumes that uh, emissions are taking place uh, and what is the plan to go to net zero if we're counting on new can um, carbon uh, capture technologies? Mm -hmm. Larry, shall I come in first? Or? Yes, for sure. I, I, I mean, I dream of being in a world where we're getting close to net zero and where this issue of going below is this the situation we're at. Maybe I've spent too long working with the aviation sector and the shipping sector and some of the heavy industries because I, I see in some areas lip service to these targets. But what matters, I think, is the actual policy, the price incentives, these kinds of things. and. Since we revised the ETS in 2008, we've been able to reward people who take emissions below zero, but it's been a completely hypothetical provision in our law because it hasn't been the case yet. I mean, we're hoping in Norway that we get some projects that are sequestrating biomass and therefore bringing net benefit to the atmosphere. We've got the project uh, from Climeworks in Iceland, which I think covers 4,000 tonnes. I mean, that 4,000 tonnes is tiny in the overall picture of things. So it's probably a long way off until we need systems that, that reward going below zero. But, but the ETS has already been able to do this for 12 years. Uh, and the critical thing with the timescales we're up against is, is pricing the positive emissions or bringing them down through other means. But, but, but I think if I, if I can chip in here, so I, think, I mean, this is one of the essential Questions, right? That, I mean, we have a, I mean, the cap effect. I mean, the, the cap goes down to zero. I, I forget which year it is, but it goes to, in 2045 or 2050 or whatever. Um, but it does go down to zero. And I mean, emissions emissions trading is a useful tool if you have to allocate something, right? If you have to allocate emissions between you know, companies and uh, the state doesn't know which companies can reduce at which cost, and then you find the, you let the market find the efficient solution to all of this. Right, that, that, I mean, that's, that's the basic theory behind it, right? So as long as you have heterogeneity in abatement costs between different companies, then this is a useful tool. But, and that's very useful, right? For, for the old targets, as we had it before in 2005, for example, or under or when we were thinking after the 2007 uh, assessment report, whichever number it was, uh, assessment report four, I, I suppose. And then we had targets like minus 80% emissions by 2050. And for targets like that, emissions trading can be helpful because there is something to allocate. And because we need to allocate these waste emissions. Now we have nothing to allocate on the one hand because we're going to zero. So this, this, this heterogeneity between options is only a matter of in which order do we shut things down, in which order do we transform things. That's the only thing that this instrument would, would then do. Um, but that ceases to be important, right? Because we, if, we, if we pick the low hanging fruit first, is more or less irrelevant if we need to pick every single apple on the tree. Then we need to get a ladder to pick all the apples. We need to find a way to pick all the apples that are up on the top of the tree. And emissions trading doesn't help us doing that, or carbon taxation for that matter. So it's it's, it's a, it, it changes, this zero changes the whole challenge. That's, that's my take on that. And then, of course, we need to talk about how to fund carbon capture technology and maintain this for several hundred, for 100 years or 200 years after we have reached net zero. And that, that's, uh, that's, I guess, for the next question. Thank you for that. And uh, here we have a question for Gohlid. Um, here they ask, uh, much of the criticism of uh, carbon pricing are coming from the supporters and indigenous people groups which directed as a false solution and primary harming their rights. Is there any ways uh, to improve the design of carbon pricing in order to work with, uh, for example, these reluctant groups uh, to reach net zero? Uh, I can't uh, hear any answer, but I see that uh, Joe's uh, raised his hand, so the floor is, uh, is yours. Well, in, indeed, uh, I wanted to reply to your question and at the same time to what Johan just said uh, about the, long the low hanging fruit. Uh, these are the easiest things to do first, and that is indeed what the carbon market is doing, but that is political realism. 
uh, in that sense that you have to bring society, our democratic society, where there are plenty of ideas, not only the ideas of low carbon emissions, you have to carry them. And when you go first for the low hanging fruit, you can demonstrate to people that you can bring down emissions without upsetting you know, uh, employment structures, regional economies, etc. And in that sense, Johan, I have a problem with your one or everything, everything or nothing. I mean, the truth of policymaking is in the gradual approach, uh, because then you have the opportunity to demonstrate that you can make the next step and you can argue for the next step. And the carbon market helps in particular uh, when uh, the, 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 the real problem is coal, as you rightly indicated, the decline policy, as you named it in, in your slides, uh, the coal phase out is facilitated tremendously through the carbon market. I mean, the, uh, the Poles and the Germans, you know, for, uh, for uh, a change, you know, they are discussing a political date that is way beyond what is normal and acceptable for the net zero, but the carbon market makes today uh, coal-fired power generation much less efficient compared to the uh, what you otherwise would have. I make uh, an exception for the last month, six weeks, eight weeks, where energy prices go through the roof. I mean that that has an international source. I think we are all a little, a little bit, you know, disappointed with what we are seeing on on, on the markets. They uh, and I take it it's rather exceptional. But um, if we make abstraction from what is happening over the last four to eight weeks, I think we can say that uh, the carbon market facilitated a lot the phase out in practice out of coal because the politics is unable to bring us closer to a decision. So the market is doing it step by step, silently, and that's a major help. So in that sense, I agree with what you said, that the carbon market is very important as a decline policy, uh, but creating the alternatives is equally important. And that is where innovation policy is so important. Your example about the electric vehicle is spot on, you know, and that is clearly what Europe was doing. On the one hand, there is a pressure you know, in terms of emissions. And on the other side, there is support for all those coming forward uh, with innovation, with, uh, with investments in this innovation, uh, what Damien was mentioning, the innovation fund and things like that. So I think the, the, the reality of the policymaking is much more nuanced um, if we, even if we go for net zero, because net zero is not for tomorrow, net zero is for 2050. And the question is how we are going to get there stepwise. And if we think stepwise, we think real life politics. And that is what matters as well. Thank you. Thank you for your reaction, Joseph. And uh, here we have uh, a question for Rajinder. Um, how do you make sure that carbon pricing isn't charged fully to the common people by the companies? And is there a mechanism that the rich who are more able to pay those taxes or those emission permits uh, don't drive up the prices for common people too much? Mm -hmm. For example, is there an extra cost for luxury products? So the, the carbon price, I appreciate the question. And I also want to respond to the indigenous people's question that came before that, because we have some experiences in California to share there. Um, on this question about the economy-wide introduction of a carbon price, it feeds into the system upstream. It feeds into the energy side of it. And then it feeds into the industrial side where you're going to actually produce goods. Once those materials and goods leave or the energy leaves and is made available to all consumers, they see the same price. But the issue with that is if you're a low income household, you are paying more relative to your income for the same good that I can afford to buy um, with a higher income. And so it's a bit regressive when you think about it that way. And when it comes to energy rates, we have policies in place so that we can protect uh, low income households from high energy rates. And um, there is no, we try to do that very progressively so that low income households get a, a larger share relative to their income of return from the cap and trade program to blunt that rate payer impact. And um, when it comes to what is priced through the system, our electricity sector is very heavily regulated in California and the US 
And so there's limits and procedures in how utilities uh, can raise prices for electricity and gas in the system. But when it comes to transportation fuels, there is no such regulation in that place. And so there has always been a concern that if we give free allowances to the transportation sector, they could use that for compliance, but still keep increasing prices saying that those are due to the cap and trade program. And so we do not give allowances to the transportation sector. We've calculated out and put on our website what we believe the impact of carbon pricing should be on the price at the pump when you buy that gas. And we've seen prices that are relatively close to that over the last uh, few years for implementing the program. So it's transparency and what that price signal should be. But there is nothing to prohibit um, a sector from increasing prices and then trying to attribute it to the compliance in the program. We just haven't seen that really play out in a meaningful way in the transportation sector. On the question about um, the indigenous peoples, I will share that California has developed its own domestic offset program because there was a lot of concern about the CDM and the experiences there. And so we opted to design our own domestic program. And we have tribal nations, sovereign tribal nations that are federal, um, federally recognized as government to government uh, organizations. Those tribal sovereign regions in California in the US are participating in our offset program because we have an offset program for forestry. And they, some of those nations have been able to use the money generated from the cap and trade program for those offsets to continue to buy back additional ancestral lands that they had lost over the last few hundred years. And so we have a lot of support among our indigenous um, native populations in, in the US. I think the challenge is more about the international forestry. And when we think about the Amazonian regions and other parts of the world, and there is a general feeling that markets are a derivative of capitalism, which they are, and that capitalism has led to the inequities that we see today between um, different industrialized regions and up and coming regions. And that is more of a philosophical argument and less about the data about how can you provide benefits through those schemes to indigenous peoples. There's a way to design it so that you can provide those benefits. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. And uh, here we have a question for Marcus. They're asking about what is the importance of adopting a carbon price compared to phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the question. And, and I, I would argue it's um, actually both. You need to, you would need to, uh, to do both. It's part of the, the broader carbon price it's implicit, explicit policy mix that jurisdictions have in hand. Depending on the national circumstances, the, the, the local political economy, you would have to choose or you would be able to choose for one or both of, the, of, 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 of these instruments. But clearly, the removal of fossil fuel subsidies in many countries, and particularly in that region, is probably uh, one of the most uh, much needed and most effective policy uh, uh, regulatory measures that uh, jurisdictions can 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 consider. So I would by no means I, I wouldn't contrast both. They're not competing. They 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 supplement each other. Thank you for your answer. And uh, here we have uh, one last question before we start to wrap up our webinar. And the question is uh, to Bianca. So there is evidence that we need to gently address uh, social justice and climate action together. To what extent can a carbon price acknowledge climate justice, uh, especially in the Eastern African region? Thank you very much for that question. And I think it sort of has a bit of a similar response to what was given by Regina. But I just start by saying that there needs to be a lot of transparency, first and foremost, in how um, markets are being used, in how you're obtaining your emission reductions, and in those benefits that are being brought forward. So the big concern, I think, for a lot of African nations is those is those benefits, like how is the end user actually seeing um, a benefit from you know, someone who's buying their emission reductions? So first and foremost, you have to be really transparent and really conservative to make sure that you are 
um, producing um, good quality emission reductions, but then the benefits need to go beyond just lowering emissions, they need to go towards enhancing their resilience. They need to go towards as many benefits as you can, you can find in because adaptation is really a top priority for a lot of um, African countries. So if you can find a way of showing that this is definitely going to contribute towards you know, more jobs, uh, more inclusion of women, better health, uh, more water, uh, access to energy, then that will enable them to see that this is actually something that's beneficial for everybody. And a lot of times, I think there's concern as to um, the individual person, but also communities. So if you're involved in that, um, the sharing of the revenues, that's a really important thing. And case studies have been seen to show that the more the community is involved in that negotiating of, you know, the air pies or whoever is getting the revenues, then that makes it more acceptable to them and just involving them from the beginning as always just with anything that's sustainable we have to involve the community and the people uh, vulnerable groups youth women from the get-go from the design all the way to when you're issuing your products so thank you for that thank you for your answer and uh, now i would suggest that uh, each one of the panelists uh, preferably in the order of the presentation so that uh, we can keep track of that uh, gives um, a one minute couple of sentences a statement to make a conclusion and we would like especially to hear your perspective on uh, the role of carbon pricing uh, to attack uh, the climate crisis uh, with a perspective on uh, social justice uh, and uh, to wrap up, then uh, Professor Dr. Katya Biedenkopf uh, will conclude uh, the webinar. Thank you. Okay, so I start. <laughs> Just very quickly then, I think uh, the, um, the carbon uh, pricing in China, it's uh, been really important uh, for the companies to um, to be, uh, you know, to, to, to have some awareness of energy uh, use and uh, how, you know, the emissions per units of energy generated, which is the case in China, um, how important this is um, um, for China's or in the in the uh, you know the bigger picture of the climate policies picture so as i said you know it's one tool uh, among other tools many tools but um, this has received um, very high political support in in china and um, it will develop i mean it has uh, had some um, um, challenges but uh, it will also uh, you know this will be solved eventually um, with regard to the social, uh, it's, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the China is big and different, you know, the economic levels are uh, very different in, in, inside China and uh, the knowledge of, of, um, of this uh, type of, you know, carbon trading is uh, low in some areas, so capacity building is going to still be very important uh, for, for China. So I can go next. This is Rajinder. Um... I have a couple of thoughts. First, California has shown that even if you don't have action at the federal level or desire at the federal level, like Damien was speaking, subnationals can move forward if they care about climate and there's strong political and social support for addressing climate. Um, and we can also have subnational uh, agreements and linkages and ETSs with other uh, governments such as Quebec. And action should not have to wait for national action. It should happen because it's imperative. We're seeing the impacts. Um, happening. I'll also note that on the social justice side, while cap and trade programs and markets are not seen favorably and prescriptive regulations are preferred even in California by our environmental justice communities and some of our frontline communities, what we've been able to do is design it so that a significant amount, majority over 50% of the revenues raised are going back to provide real benefits in those communities whether it's access to clean energy, clean technology, or other programs, that money is being reinvested. And those programs are very well received in those communities. They may not like that it's coming from cap and trade, but they absolutely are benefiting from the design of the program in terms of the auction revenues being returned back. That is probably one of the biggest ways to show the benefits of a program on the social justice side is to reinvest in helping on historical issues or social issues that have been in those regions. And then also making sure that those households have access to zero emission vehicles or solar panels for their roofs. Um, and with that, I will conclude. Thank you. 
think I'm the next one. It's going to be difficult to follow Kahindra for providing their, her practical evidence of, of how well-designed carbon pricing instruments can really they may contribute a significant contribution to mitigation objectives, but beyond mitigation objectives to local sustainable development priorities and uh, taking into account uh, just transition considerations of, in accordance with, with local circumstances. I, I, I don't want to run the risk of repeating <laughs> myself with some of the key messages I would want to, to share, but as we've discussed with, 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 with the fellow panelists, I mean, there is clearly no, carbon pricing is not a panacea. There is no bullet, uh, one, one silver uh, uh, bullet solution on, uh, on this, but clearly it's part of the toolbox that jurisdictions, be it at the national level, be it at the local level, have in hand to, to, to uh, contribute to their own mitigation uh, targets. At the end of the day, depending on the local circumstances, the design will determine to what extent you can harness not only mitigation uh, benefits, but also development benefits. Okay, I think I was number four, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so I, I think it, I mean, I, I, it may have uh, been noted by some of you that, that I have a little more critical stance on carbon pricing than most people here. Um, but I think that the usefulness of carbon pricing uh, revolves around the, the revenues, around the use of revenues. And this is one reason why I explicitly do not say we should scrap carbon pricing schemes. I say we should be cautious about introducing new ones, but we should not scrap the ones we have because we have these revenues. And I think that the, the social issue, I mean, it's very big and it's very important, but I think it's also, and here, here comes something controversial again, to note that energy poverty or poverty or injustice in general is not caused by climate policy. People are poor before we have climate policy. So, and, and we, before we have climate policy, we tend to somehow accept these injustices for incorrect reasons or for way, very weird reasons. Um, and I think it is not useful to chip in all everything on climate policy and have climate policy measured against uh, environmental effectiveness and justice and solving the poverty problems and so on and so forth. So I think it's worth to be a little bit careful there that we don't kill off climate policy by using this argument, but arguing for another also very important topic in the same in the same bucket, so to speak. But at the same time, I think we can use these revenues in ways that are both climate effective and socially just. So we don't need to repay money to people just directly as most countries do or plan to do, but we can spend it on, I don't know, we can, for example, give rebates to buy new refrigerators for people below a certain threshold, income threshold, for example. That way we can have climate benefits and social benefits at the same time. And it's worth thinking about that. How can we repay this money in a socially just way that also is climate effective? But other than that, I think it's worth to just reflect on the role of carbon pricing if we see that, well, it's not really triggering investments. We see that it's not really triggering technology development. I fundamentally disagree with Damien there on, on it, we're not gonna get aviation fuels by having a carbon price of 60 or 100 or 200 euros per ton. We need a carbon price of a thousand euros per ton to get solar fuels, for example, into the market at all. Otherwise they will not come. And we cannot expect R&D to happen through this, but we can expect R&D to happen supported entirely or partially by the revenues. So again, everything circles around the revenues. I think this is also really underemphasized in the debate. So that was slightly over a minute, so I'm going to stop there. To Bianca now. Sorry about that. Uh, great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I did manage to join from the beginning, but even the few presentations I listened to, very, very uh, insightful, very interesting, uh, very and very hard to follow your heart, actually, because it's, I don't know, sometimes it's contradicting and makes very valid points as well. But I think uh, what I would say, just based on what I'm listening and uh, just our experience as well, is that I, I, I do agree, like you, you shouldn't just say you can only use one. Um, I think you should explore all options and you should explore how well they interact with other you know, policies that are in place. And this is for both markets and also for taxes. Like either way, just you don't have to say you have this one or that's it. No, that's not, that's not the case. And for us, 
I think um, as a region, we're actually looking into a feasibility. We know like we won't have an ETS tomorrow, which will take some time, but we need to look into the feasibility of that. And it's true, like the revenues when you're thinking both carbon taxation and ETS is important. And um, just like he said, it's really important that the people can see what is being done with that money. If it's a taxation, it needs to be very clear where it's going into climate action. and like that, that transparency is really, really important. So I think I'll just um, conclude with saying that you have to be transparent, you have to avoid double counting, you have to um, preserve environmental integrity. So it's important, you have to factor in sustainable development and whether you're doing it through revenues or whichever avenue you're doing, it has to be factored in. So thank you, yeah. You muted, Damon. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So to conclude, and I just commented to Johan in the chat, uh, I mean, I think it would be great to have more people looking at the International Civil Aviation Organization and its ideas for, for so-called carbon pricing. Because, I mean, I, I agree with Johan. Um, I think we're held to impossible standards sometimes for those who want to do climate policy. It's not responsible for the ills that pre-existed in the world. And the most unjust thing of all is catastrophic climate change. Um, carbon pricing is one way to help avoid catastrophic climate change. I think all of us who have spoken agree it's not the only way. And I think if I give one message, it's, it's not waiting. It would be taking whatever actions in our jurisdictions we can do in the near term to remove fossil fuel subsidies, to make pollution more expensive, to fund the alternatives we need. Uh, dramatic urgent action now because we're on track to, to three, three and a half degrees centigrade warming. So, um, I mean, the EWTS has worked in the European context. It's not clear that it can work at a US federal context. It's not clear that it can work at the global level. Uh, there was a question in the chat about neighboring European countries. We're, we're offering to share experience. I think there's funding there to sort of build up policies. Um, Europe's working with others, but the Chinese context is not the European context. The African context is not the European context. We're aware of that, but we, as Europe, we've reduced now to 8% of global emissions. So not only are we doing stuff ourselves, but we want to work with the rest of the world to get bottom-up action that actually will do something to avoid the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Uh, we are already four minutes over time, so I will really just leave it by um, thanking all the participants. I think we should continue this discussion. Uh, this really showed that two hours are not enough to talk about all these very important aspects, social justice, effectiveness, um, where does it work, how are countries different. So um, thanks a lot to all the participants for making so much time, for sharing your very valuable insights, for also um, yeah helping us to understand whether and how carbon pricing policies can get us to the climate neutrality that um that we all want so um thanks a lot have a great evening day depending on where you are and uh, let's continue this discussion thank you very much bye <laughs>